Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for coming here tonight, and may I welcome you to the Royal Society. My name is Julie Maxton, I'm the Executive Director of the Society, and it's a great pleasure to have with us tonight Jim Al-Khalili and Bill Bryson as our special guests. Now, I have the job of doing the housekeeping before they get started, so if you could bear with me, could you please make sure that all mobile phones are off? We don't have any planned fire evacuations, so if you hear anything, it's not planned, and therefore we should take note. And there is um, a fire exit over there, and there's one at the back, as you, the door you came through. Um, the event is being recorded and webcast for our archives, and my job is simply to say another welcome to you and a special welcome to Jim's mum and dad who have come tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and may I say a little bit about Jim and then ask him to introduce Bill. Jim Al-Khalili is Professor of Theoretical Physics and the Chair in the Public Engagement in Science at the University of Surrey. He was awarded the Royal Society Michael Faraday Prize for Science Communication in 2007 and elected an honorary fellow of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. He has been a fellow of the Institute of Physics since 2000, when he also received the Institute's Public Awareness of Physics Award. He's achieved a wide prominence as a public scientist, author, and broadcaster. He's fronted a number of radio and television documentaries, including The Life, Scientific, and Chemistry, A Volatile History, which was nominated for a BAFTA. It's our great pleasure to have Jim here tonight and to ask him to introduce Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So I've, I've got some notes in large 16 font so that I don't need... I'm so vain I don't want to wear my reading glasses. No, so I don't have to look at Bill over my glasses. Uh, it is my, my genuine pleasure to have this opportunity to have this chat. Uh, I gather that this, the event is, is uh, so popular that uh, the Royal Society have had to turn a number of people away despite filling this, this hall and a, a breakout room. Uh, testament to, uh, to, to your popularity, Bill, I'm sure. Um, so, Bill Bryson, OBE, best-selling travel writer, uh, indeed the UK's highest-selling author of non-fiction, although I think Bill would want to um, correct that to say highest-selling author of non-fiction provided it doesn't include food recipes, <laughs> uh, provided it's not the highway code, I mean, that, that, but that's getting picky. Uh, Bill's an acclaimed science communicator, historian, man of letters, Honorary Fellow of the uh, um, Cavalry Institute of Particle Physics uh, in California, Honorary Fellow of the British Science Association, and indeed an Honorary Fellow of, of the Royal Society. And Bill says he's always nervous about entering the Royal Society. He thinks someone's going to stop him at the, at the door and say, you know, you're not a real scientist, uh, you can't come in. Um, uh, many awards and prizes. I'm not going to read them out, Bill, because that would just take up the whole hour. Basically, lots of people like you <laughs> uh, and, and, and have rewarded you. Um, uh, Bill Bryson was born, raised and educated in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, but has spent most of his adult life in, in Britain, um, uh, in, in England. Uh, his books here have sold more than 15 million copies and translated into 30 languages. Probably Bill's best-known book, Notes from a Small Island, uh, written in the mid-90s, was a massive bestseller. And it was chosen, I believe, by Radio 4 listeners as the best book ever written on the British identity. He says there's something about Britain that suits him. After coming here in the early 70s, he did go back to the US uh, in the mid-90s for less than a decade before he, 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 he missed us too much and had to come back. He says he, he uh, uh, missed the pub and British TV. I think that's, that's the, the reason he came back. And Bill then spent six years as Chancellor of the University of Durham. Um, it was about, or just over 10 years ago now, that Bill wrote uh, his best-selling popular science book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, uh, which even within the genre of popular science books was hugely popular. I remember as a, as a popular science writer thinking, well, I'm not going to read that book. You know, the, here he is, 
He's a travel writer and he's writing about our, our stuff. And then reluctantly, I did pick it up. And it's probably the best book on popular science that I've ever read. Um, Bill's also edited the Royal Society's uh, 350th anniversary book, Seeing Further. Um, the format of the scene is that I'll, I want to be asking Bill some questions about his life and his work, uh, not just about his passion for science, although I, I do want to um, obviously touch on that, and then leave some time at the end to open it up for uh, uh, questions from, from you, from the audience. Long introduction, Bill, but good evening. Well, thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me start by, by, by asking this. You've called yourself uh, a tourist who writes books. Uh, you're referring to your hugely successful travel books. When you took that huge leap into popular science writing, were you still in that mindset? You saw yourself as a, as, as a tourist in the world of science? Well, in a way, because I mean, all I've ever seen myself as really is just as a reporter. I mean, I grew up in the world of journalism. I worked on newspapers for many years. And, you know, and I, I did a lot of freelance assignments as a um, but one day I was working on, on newspapers, but also afterwards when I was trying to make a living as a freelance writer. And, and essentially, you know, you, um, um, what a journalist does is you, you have, are given an assignment, you, you go in, out to find information about that, you don't know anything about that subject um, until you go out and talk to people and you gather information and then, and then you convey in, in the written word as much as you've learned and what you think is, a, is relevant and, and interesting about what you've learned in the course of doing interviews and so on. So it was just expanding that to different kinds of books. I never, I never set out to, to be a travel writer. That was really quite accidental. What happened was the first book I did was a book called The Lost Continent, which was about going traveling around America. Uh, by this point, I had lived out of the country for about 15 years. So the idea was that I would travel around America and I would see how it had changed and how I had changed in the 15 years since I had lived there, mostly grown up there. Um, and that did really quite well, I mean, un unexpectedly well, and it got good reviews. And so my publisher, when I went back to him to talk about a second book, he, he said, you know, it has to be a travel book. That's what you do now. You're a travel writer, whether you want to or not. That's what... And for uh, several books, I was, I was strongly encouraged to do more travel books. But it wasn't, um, much as I enjoyed doing them, it wasn't what I wanted to spend my life doing exclusively. And so I always had it in mind that I'd like to do other kinds of books. And eventually, I, I reached a point of success where I was able to start, um, you know, bullying back my publishers when they wanted me to do a kind of book and you know, to saying I, I wanted to do something else. And um, I'd, I'd always wanted to do a book about science, try to understand science and how it works. And so they indulged me and allowed me to do it. But because it did quite well, that changed the whole dynamics of what kind of books I, I was going to write after that. You mentioned your, your, your first book, The Lost Continent. Um, Getting into travel writing, was, did it have anything to do with your upbringing? I know you used to go on these long holidays with, with your, your father, with your family in the beaten up Chevy and get lost. Was there something about, or was it just wanting to get out of Des Moines? <laughs> well, it was, it was a strange thing. Growing up in Des Moines, I mean, I look back there and I realised that Des Moines Iowa was a very, very nice place to grow up. It was, a, you know, it's a very, it's a wholesome, clean, friendly place. You won't find anyone nicer on the planet than Iowans, so you, you really won't. Um, and... And it was, you know, so in lots of ways, when I reflect on it, it was a fantastic place to have grown up. And I was growing up there in the 1950s, you know, in the middle of the country, in the middle of the 20th century, in a nice middle-class household. So it was, it was an idyllic time to be, uh, to be a child and an idyllic place in which to have a childhood. But at the time I was living in it, I just thought, I felt, I felt very disadvantaged. I thought, this is the middle of nowhere. Everywhere I, you know, everywhere else seems to have brighter lights and more excitement and more interesting things going on. We seem to uh, a hopeless backwater. And I grew up really, really wanting to see the, the rest of the world. And the only glimpses of it I had in, in the, my childhood years was that, was that every summer my father was f a fanatical summer vacationist. And he would put us into, a, into um, you know, a, an estate car and take us off on these epic drives all around America, mostly to go to to Civil War battlefields and, and Revolutionary War battlefields and things like that. So they were actually pretty boring vacations, but at the same time it was a chance to see some of, the, of, of a wider America. And you must have, looking back, enjoyed your, your childhood there. I mean, you, it, m more recently you wrote The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, which is basically your memoirs as a, as a child growing up. Uh, so fond memories of, of, of the place. Yeah, well, I, I wrote... 
When I wrote The Lost Continent, um, all I was trying to do really was be funny. I'd never written a book before. I'd never written a narrative <laughs> book before. I, I had done a couple of dictionaries, you know, word usage books and things like that for sub-editors. But I had never written a book that had chapters and a whole was telling a story. And I was mostly trying to make jokes, uh, and I was expected to be was supposed to be, you know, I was expected to write a funny, comical book about about a trip around America, and um, and I, in retrospect, looking back on it years later, I realized that I had I had been, I think, much too hard on certain things. And people in in Iowa, people in the Middle West of America, um, it, I had been too too scornful of them. Whereas actually. I you know, had some real fond memories of it. So as a corrective, many years later, I decided that I would write a memoir, which, which essentially I had revisited the same territory, but looked at it in a, in a considerably more magnanimous way, and still making lots of jokes, but also talking about, I think more warmly, about Iowans and the people that I grew up with. Because they were really good people, and, um, and you know, I am what I am entirely because of all these, these fantastically heartwarming, formative experiences I was privileged to have. Now, you've been quoted as saying you, you think you're the world's worst storyteller. <laughs> I mean, in writing, that's, that's what's so endearing about your, your, your writing. They're, these are great stories. Do you feel just uncomfortable telling, I mean, on, on an occasion like this, you'd much rather write those stories down? Is yeah, that, I, I, absolutely. I, mean, I would much rather, this, I mean, this is, this is a very agreeable experience for me because because um, it's it's really nice to meet people who have read your stuff and and uh, and like it enough to turn out in the evening. And so I don't I don't mean to you know be dis disrespectful of this occasion at all um, because when you're a writer it is it is really an extremely solitary you'll you'll agree I'm sure solitary experience that you write the book and you send it out the publisher publishes it and any feedback you get is just you know very much second hand you don't you don't get to an audience response, the way you would if you were a performer, a stand-up comedian or something. So you are really quite well rem far removed and um, all you, you get are royalty statements and, and you know, book reviews. So you know that, it, you know, I mean, you know that if the book is doing well, but you don't actually have any sense of it occupying individual minds anyway. You don't, it's, 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 just, it's this thing that is no longer yours, it's gone out into the wider world. So this is, this is, Terrific when you meet people and you get a chance to chat to them um, and have and, and just see them in this you know in in a single room. But having said all of that, my instinct is t is to write, to be alone, to be away from you know. I'm really quite an introverted person, and um, if I had wanted to be on a stage and be a performer, I would have I would have made that my career. But it, it almost you know inevitably follows that if you choose to be a writer, it's because you are a fairly retiring sort of person. Now, you came to Britain in the early 70s, uh, and, and as I said in the introduction, you fell in love with the country. Uh, you didn't fall in love with everything. I think you've tried to like cricket and Marmite, <laughs> but, but yeah. haven't quite managed. There was, no, that's not quite correct, because never, I've never tried to like Marmite. Oh, okay. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lost cause. <laughs> I have tried cricket. I did, I did actually realise when, um, because I, I came to Britain and I, and I, and I I also met, quite soon after I came here, I met a student nurse at the hospital I was working at. So I was falling for her and falling for Britain pretty much simultaneously. And I'm, ha I'm happy to say I'm with both of them 40 years later. Uh, <laughs> so that worked out very nicely for me. But um, when, I, when I knew that once we, you know, once we became engaged, I knew that both she and Britain and her family and all of that were going to be permanent features of my life. Her father was very, 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 very keen on cricket, and he used to spend whole Saturday afternoons um, just just watching cricket, often with such an intensity that he would seem to lose consciousness for an hour or so. <laughs> and, um, and and I and I so I thought I have to I have to sit down with this man, and have him explain it to me. So really, quite soon uh, soon after my arrival here, he I knew what all you know I knew what was going on. He explained very patiently explained to me LBWs and all of the you know all the arcana of of what was going on with cricket. So I understood how it operated. Um, what I've never entirely successfully done is, is understood why anybody would devote five days of the time to watch it. <laughs> well, actually, you and me both. <laughs> um, but you know, you've been in this country for so long, and, and I guess people can hear that your your Iowan accent is, 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 is has been diluted somewhat over sure. the years. You've never taken up uh, British citizenship, though. No, but um, I'm I'm just about to. It appears ah. I, I've just this week come from a, a 
a meeting with a, a lawyer and um, you know discussing issues of inheritance and and all of that. And the the, the rather tragic case is that if you're if you're an American and you're married to a Briton, um, the American Internal Revenue Service absolutely clobbers your wife if you should predecease her, which is the statistical probability. So one of the ways of getting around that would be for me to m become British subject. Um, I mean, it doesn't entirely solve it because America's tax situation is immensely complex, but the first step would be for me to, to become a British subject. And I also think that um, it, it, you know, it is a recognition of the fact that I, I, have, I really have been here for a very long time and I expect to spend the rest of my days here. So I have to, I have to sit the test now and I've been doing the mock exams and they're really tough. The questions are, they're not all of them, a, a, a lot of them are pretty simple, but, but you know, there's a few in there that are tough and I'm not sure that I agree with the answers. One of them was, <laughs> well one of, them, one of the questions in the mock exam anyway was, um, Pa true or false, pantomimes are based on fairy tales, fairy stories. And I said false, and they said no, true. Because I, I don't know, I mean, aren't pantomimes always based on... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, Dick Turpin's not a, it's not a fairy story, it's not... Um, or Dick Whittington, um, and I mean, mostly they're based on... Um, well, the Christmas ones that I had like that. to, that I got, my kids dragged me to, were all, were all, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk and things like that, so Beauty and the Beast. And yeah, I, I would say yes, but okay, well, good, I'd pass. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of tough questions there, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to study hard for the exam. But it's nice, but you you're, you're sort of want to sort of get British citizenship because you feel somehow it's about to, not because you're on, I mean, you're only in your early 60s, you're not on your way out yet, that you feel somehow you need to sort of tie up your finances. You're close enough, it's time to get serious about it, you know, um, <laughs> and it's, no, I mean, it's, it's a strange thing because, I mean, the only, the only reason I've ever resisted, well, two reasons I've resisted. One is just, you know, just lethargy and indolence and, and not getting around to it. Um, but the other one is that it always seems to me that, it, you know, I am an American and I, I, I will never really properly be British. I mean, you can't, you have to be born to that. Um, I, and I can, I can have a, you know, a little book that says I am, you know, recognized and free to come and go as a, as a British subject, but I will never be British, and so I just felt that there was something slightly fraudulent about me, a bit like just changing your hair color or something, it's just not, you know, and I just, I always slightly resisted it for, for that reason, but, um, you know, if I, if I do attain a British passport, I'll be very proud to have it, I can tell you. Now, you, you, you began your, your working life here uh, in, in Britain as a, as a journalist, so the, the, the Bournemouth Echo, the, then the, the, the Times, the Independence, uh, and, and you wrote about the, those times in your um, uh, notes from a small island. You also um, were working through the, the, the whopping uh, crisis with Murdoch. I mean, it, that's, is, was that something that would not have happened in America? Or did you find that quite a strange? Yeah, it was a strange thing. To look to back, in. looking back on it now, it's a very strange thing. But it was, I think, it was the last kind of really big. Uh, eruption of, of um, ugliness and people taken to the streets in, in Britain in a big way, and um, and uh, you know and most of us as journalists were very sympathetic to you know people were people were coming in from all over the country and people were being bussed in from all over the country miners and so on um, to protest about what Murdoch was doing to uh, all, all these unions he was absolutely dismantling all these unions so we were caught in a really uncomfortable position. Which you know I didn't like at all. The fact of the matter was that the, the principal print union, the National Graphical Association, the NGA, was really a very brutish outfit, and and they had they had resisted progress for for years. Um, and and they actually you know it, it, it's hard looking at it realistically to say that they should have somehow been preserved. Really, they, they wanted to be just swept away. But Murdoch also, the same, on the same occasion, he took the opportunity to, to sweep away a lot of other people, all of the clerical people, the librarians, who, who were not only really nice people in themselves, but also were from pretty mild and innocuous unions. Um, and so it was, it was a terrible time to be a, a journalist. The NUJ, the National Union of Journalists, was really quite spineless throughout this whole thing, and we were, we were sort of caught in the middle. And it was... Um, it was, it was a very strange experience, you know, how people throwing bricks at your car when you were leaving work every night. It's um, quite, it was quite unnerving. Um, but also, it was a little 
tempered by the fact that you really felt, well, you kind of deserved it because we weren't, we weren't exactly scabs, but we weren't really, we, were, we had capitulated. And, um, and that's the reason that so many of us left as the first opportunity. I mean, I, I, I had a young family I simply economically couldn't afford to do the right thing and, and not go to Wapping, so I went. But it's the first opportunity I went and, and joined The Independent, along with at least two or three hundred other journalists from The Times, um, because they were so dismayed by, by the position they'd been put in. I'd like to I'm move sorry, on to... that was to... more than you wanted to know. No, 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 that's good. But we thought we can draw a line under that. Good, <laughs> we've, we've covered that. I'd like to get on to the science. You might be, well, probably that's what people have uh, come to hear. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, and of course, you are, I guess, among scientists best known for your short history of nearly everything. You're a hugely popular uh, 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 bestseller. Can I just ask you, um, who chose the title? You or your publishers? Because it, it is a good sort of play on... Stephen Hawking's brief history of time. Well, it time. wasn't intended. It, I didn't. I had. I didn't have that in mind at all. I okay. Honestly, didn't when I was um, when it was doing. What it was was my. I, I told my publishers I wanted to do a book about science, in particular about the universe, and 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 the way I explained to them was, I, you know, I wanted to do the whole history of the universe. I said, you know, there was a this, a Big Bang, thirteen and a half billion years ago or so, uh, that began it all, and then there's us here today, how did we get from there to here? So, you know, what is the whole story? I want to understand as much of it as I possibly can. Um, I want to cover as much of that ground as I possibly can. So when they were, and I'd be working away, and then when they'd say to me, what is your book about? I said, well, this is about nearly everything, really. And um, <laughs> so that became, that be, so the working title became, almost as a joke, between me and my, and my publishers was just a short history of nearly everything. And, um, and then I decided that actually I, I quite liked that as a title, and, and we kept it. I mean, it, it won the, the Royal Society, the Aventus Prize that uh, no longer exists now. But I remember <coughs> listening to you talking about it uh, here, actually, on this, on this stage, um, probably 10 years ago. Maybe yeah, it was, it was right. I mean, I was, it, I was very honoured to, to win that. Um, and, and I have to say, I was, I was treated extremely well by, by scientists in the scientific community. Um, any, any scientist could quite easily pick that book to pieces. I mean, at least, at least the area of their expertise. Because you could just say, this is way too superficial. This is, you know, you've made a lot of generalizations here. This is, you've not properly represented particle physics or, you know, quest for human origins or... Well, there's a Frank Close there. He writes about particle physics. Leave that job to him. You know? <laughs> what I liked about it was that, uh, you know, you, you covered the physics, you know, quite... You gave it, not short shrift, but you covered it quickly, and then you got onto stuff that I didn't know anything about, you know, geology and things like that. that, that, that well, was and I mean, it, so it's, it's pretty superficial, Botany. but it's intended to be. It couldn't be otherwise. I mean, because, right. of the, because of the scope of what I was taking on, and because of the, you know, even though the book is 500 some pages, that really leaves very little room for any particular field or discipline. So it wasn't ever going to be anything other than quite superficial. Um, so it's not really a book about science. It's more a book about what I learned in my you know, four-year visit to the world of science, and which is really quite a, a different thing. It was also the, the thing that I grew fascinated with was how do scientists figure things out? I mean, I, I still find that the most amazing thing, and it's the, th it's the one thing that scientists almost universally take for granted, but it is, it is the most amazing. How do they figure things out? You know, how do they know where the continents were 300 million years ago, or how, how hot it is on the surface of the sun, or you know, the, when people left Africa, and how they got to Australia, and just you know, what, what goes on in the heart of a cell, or a gene, or any of that stuff. How do people figure these things out? I mean, I just find that quite amazing. And so really, an awful lot of the book is looking at that. How did people work these things out? So it's not really explaining what goes on at the heart of a gene, it's more explaining what, you know, what, what little mysteries some dedicated soul worked out. But you spent several years you know, researching on the book, so it wasn't as though it was like it's some hack who just goes along and interviews people and writes stuff up. You really got stuck into the subject matter and got to know the people, well, the characters. Well, it was so interesting. I mean, for me, it was so interesting. And the experience I had again and again as I was doing the book was thinking, this is, this is amazing. Whatever, you know, I've just learned this amazing fact. Why didn't they teach me this in school? I'd have paid attention if they'd taught me this in school. <laughs> um, why didn't they give me all this human interest stuff? Um, I mean, my experience with science in school, and, and I say this from the perspective of somebody who is not, you know, has no aptitude to be a scientist. But my whole experience of it was that, you know, first day of a science class, 
the, t the teacher comes in, turns his back on the class, and starts writing out diagrams and formulas and equations and so on on the blackboard. And as soon as they do that, they've lost me completely. They, um, they've, you know, they've captivated all the natural scientists in the room, but they, but they lose most, most of the students. And I just thought, you know, if you told a little bit of the human interest story alongside the equations and formulas and so on, you, you, you might just capture some of those drifting people that, that you're not, you know, that don't automatically connect with the mathematics or the, you know, the hard science side of it. And I, I think that's a mistake that we make universally in terms of how science is taught, that there could be a little bit more of, this is cool, this is neat, this is really interesting, you should pay attention here because this is, um, you know, that there is a purpose to it all. It's not just about numbers and formulas and, you know, sort of fevered things being written out on a blackboard in a hurry. This, this actual, um, this actually changes lives and makes the world a better place. And I got the impression, I'm even listening to you talking now, that the d discovering some of these scientific stories for yourself, you know, doing the research for the book was almost, in, in some sense, more exciting and fulfilling for you than the writing of the, the book? Well, I took the, you know, I took the view. I, very soon after I started working on the book, I realized there are a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of really good popular science out there. I mean, clearly, I, I, I was already vaguely aware of it, but the more I started doing research, the more I realized that, there are, you know, there's just a, a lot of extremely good popular books in science written by scientists. You know, you don't need a out, complete outsider to start writing popular books on science because you've already got all these books by people like, you know, Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins and Matt Ridley and, you know, you name it. Um, and, 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 and these are really terrific books written from, a, you know, from the perspective of someone who is, is a, an expert in these fields and really, really knows his business. So I thought, well, what, what can I bring to this? And the only thing I could re really bring to it was ignorance. I mean, I could actually, I tried to make a virtue of that because the one thing I had, the one advantage I felt I had was that I had this infinite capacity to be amazed by everything I was learning because it was all new to me. And, and that's really all, if you look at the book, that's a large part, that's what it is. It's just me being amazed over and over again. And I guess unlike the sort of, precision of, uh, you know, the, the accuracy required to write a, a biography or historical account. Certainly, you know, drawing on your travel writing, uh, where you said it, it's a bit like writing a novel because, you, you know, you can talk about anything and you can exaggerate, you know, to, to make a particular point. But when, when it comes to popular science writing, did you then have to sort of pull back and, and think, well, I've got to be more rigid and more precise about how I say yeah, things. Yeah, it was really hard. I mean, the, it, it was really hard, really hard. Writing was often hard because you have to simplify, but without, you know, oversimplifying. And, and essentially, very often I, was, I had to get permission from, I had various mentors who were helping me with various fields, and I had to, you know, essentially get their permission to, to write a generalization about their field. And almost always I found they didn't like it, you know, because, because to them, it, it, it's it's not as simple as that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you, I, I mean, I can't really think of a good example, but but if I were writing about your field in physics, I might say something like, you know, there are three basic ways to split an atom or something, you know. And and you would say, oh gosh, no, there's also, you know. And you start listing all the other ways and all the exceptions, and you, because mm -hmm. because that's your field, you would you would be thinking of all the exceptions to that, and it would be very hard for me to satisfy you with some sim simple version. So it was hard to do that. And then it was also really hard to put these in ways that hadn't been expressed by, before by others. I mean, often I would read somebody like, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, who would explain this thing brilliantly, but I couldn't just use his words because that would be plagiarism. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to think of some uh, way that was original to me. And, th yeah. and that became very, very hard because I, there was, with me, it was not only, not only the necessity of coming up with a new way of expressing it, but then the danger of, of expressing it incorrectly because of my mm. imperfect understanding of all these things. I mean, I, a nice example of that. I used to think, you know, getting into science communication, popular science writing, that there's always a way of explaining some difficult concept in science. You just have to find the right language. You just have to remove the jargon and you put yourself in the other. And then uh, you realise, and I, I, I interviewed Peter Higgs on, on, on the radio uh, um, a couple of months ago, and there was this lovely moment where I said, right, look, you are Peter Higgs. It's, you know, it's your job uh, to, to explain what, what is the Higgs mechanism. And, 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 it, and Peter just went to this beautiful sort of eloquent two-minute explanation. And I'm thinking, right, I understand that. That's beautiful. 
it's not going to get used. It's all just going to be edited out. And at the end of it, uh, I said, well, thank you, Peter. For me as a physicist, that, that was beautiful. And he looked at me and said, but it's not going to be understood by anyone else. And I didn't say anything. I said, well, as a challenge, can you explain what the Higgs mechanism is in 30 seconds? No. <laughs> can you explain in a minute? No. And, and, and actually, that whole discussion, the two minutes and the asking to explain, made it into the programme. Right. Because actually, it's a good point. Sometimes in science, that what right do we have to think that you can explain something in a bite-sized when Peter Higgs has spent years and years and years trying to, we've had half a century before we can prove his ideas right, what right do we have to think we can sort of simplify it down to some bare little nuggets or, or sound bites? Quite, but, but in a sense you have to do that. I mean, you, you know, if you're writing, if you're writing a, a, you know, a sweeping look at the whole of science, yeah. you, you're, again and again you're put in that position. I mean, I was acutely aware the whole time I was writing the book that this is... You know, I'm not doing justice to these things. And um, often it was really, really hard. You know, the, the two hardest parts of the book for me were, were um, you know, the subatomic world, which didn't surprise me at all, because that's very, you know, it's totally counterintuitive and it's very hard to understand what's going on. And all of this stuff, you start talking about quarks and leptons and, you know, it gets really confusing very fast to any, any lay person at all. And, um, and then it becomes really hard to how, how do I, connect when I can only barely grasp the rudiments of this, how do I then explain it in a book? That didn't surprise me that that was hard, but the other part, the other one that was really, really hard and nearly impossible um, to feel that I was writing about with any confidence was, was uh, human origins. Because there's just so much, there's, there's so many divided opinions about it and there's so many you know, bone fragments that one group of people will say, this is absolutely vital and this is, you know, um, this, this, the, you know, this indicates that humans went off in this whole other line here, and then there's some other bone fragment, and mm. that indicates that they did something else altogether. And you realize that it's, you don't know who to trust. You don't know. I mean, these are, everybody you talk to, everybody you read about, they're all, you know, they're all are operating in good faith, and they're decent human beings, but their opinions are so splintered and fractured that it's impossible to know really. I don't think there is anybody who, you know, really has has taken a kind of measured view of the whole thing and doesn't have um, some large measure of bias involved in it. Well, I guess luckily these days it's DNA plays an important well, that's role. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. Which, which lots possibly and lots has even changed since you wrote the book. Yeah, no, I was going to say there's lots and lots of things that have changed since I wrote the book, and, and I think um, you know what they're doing with DNA, and just things like sorting out, you know, whether whether uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred got together. Is, yeah. um, I mean, that was a sh really huge issue uh, uh, ten years ago, and now you know DNA is mm. is resolving that very quickly. Well, I mean, like it or not, you've now become um, a sort of a, a spokesperson, a champion of of, of science. Um, in November two thousand and six, I think it was you 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 interviewed then Prime Minister Tony Blair on the state of science and education. Um, how did how did that come about? Well, that was, it, was a, it was a very strange experience, but it was, it was um, at their, they, they um, asked me to. I mean, they were, they were setting up a, a, some kind of um, blogs, or I, I don't know what you call them, podcasts, uh, that uh, they were having various journalists interview the prime minister. He was on his way out in those days. And, um, and he, he really did... Uh, he was very polite and very genial, and um, it, was, it was quite exciting for me to get to go to Downing Street and sit with the you know, prime minister of the country. But I also felt that he was, uh, you know, his, his term of office was coming to an end, and, and um, it, it didn't seem as if he was particularly engaged with the questions I was asking him. There wasn't any reason why he should be. So it was a slightly strange experience, um, but very, very, very interesting. And I, I mean, I, I just... I, um, I can't. I can't pretend that I, you know that I took advantage of it in some way that helped get greater funding for science <laughs> or anything like that. I mean, I think th these days it does seem that you're sort of ranked alongside a lot of people from outside of science, and particularly I'm thinking of comedians, Robin Ince, Dara O'Brien, Tim Minchin, Ben Miller, who are you know, and, and include you in, in that group of people who are championing science and, and, and rationality in a way that science scientists themselves maybe you haven't been able to, to do very, very successfully. Do you feel a sense of responsibility now that you're part of this movement to somehow to, to do your bit, to come along to events like this or no, promoting science and education? No, not really. I mean, I'm happy to do it. It's because it gets me, you know, it gets me invited into places like this and it's, you know, it's a great privilege and pleasure to 
to be there. But I really, I mean, I do think that scientists, by and large, do a pretty good job of selling themselves. And I do think the one thing that Britain can be very pleased with is that it, it projects popular science extremely well. I mean, you're a, a sterling example of that um, with the you know, television programs like the, the chemistry program series and, um, and just, you know, ongoing programs like Horizon and so on. And um, there's, there's a lot of good, I mean, really, really good popular science out there, probably more now than there's ever been, I think, in yeah, certain in true, time. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, but a lot of it is really good. I mean, um, and I, I think that's something that kind of gets taken for granted, you know, that um, it's really moved on to an, another level of presentation where very often you learn a lot, you know, as a lay person, you can learn a lot about various fields by watching a, a, a series of documentaries on, on a particular field. Um, and I think, so, you know, I don't think you really need me and Tim Minchin and um, all, all the other people that, you, that you've m mentioned. Um, you, you know, scientists are doing a very, very excellent job of, of selling themselves already. But at the same time, I suppose there's no harm the more voices you have, because it is so important, and science does tend to get um, marginalized, and certainly by politicians, I think that they tend to, they take it for granted, and, um, or they somehow feel that it will look after itself, and that, you, you know, um, and that's just really foolish, because science needs a lot of funding, needs a very ex expensive undertaking, but it, but it mm. also is um, hugely important economically, and hugely important in terms of solving the world's problems. I mean, I think part of the, the problem is that because there are so many ways of getting the message out there, is that, you know, people just have so, you know, opinions coming at them from all directions, they need to understand how science works, you know, this evidence base and so on. So they know, you know, there's a hundred blogs and, and you know, and, and which one is, is written by someone who knows what they're talking about and what sort of ideas are based on peer-reviewed research. You know, there are all sorts of topics where if there's, yeah, yeah, there's, agree, a, there's a noise out there that people need to be able to discriminate. And, and, and it, is hard to, it is often hard. I mean, the, there's, you know, conventional science gets challenged in, in a lot of ways. I mean, in America, it gets challenged by creationists and who actually challenge it very effectively and, you know, undermine a lot of, you know, genuine science so that, so that more than half the people in the United States now believe that, you know, that they believe in that evolution is... You said a, more than half now. Are you suggesting it's getting worse? I think it is getting worse. It's, it certainly is a, you know, a critical point where, where you know, it, a belief in, in evolutionary theory is becoming a, a, minor, a minority view and I think that's really quite... Um, scary so far that it's been it's been resisted pretty effectively in schools and things, but it's constantly being challenged there. So I mean, I think that's a, a dangerous precedent there. I and I think here, <coughs> I'm pleased to say that I don't see any real evidence of that happening here. But I have to say, what what seems to be happening here is that an awful lot of print journalism has got pretty bad when it comes to conveying science. Um, just a lot of mistakes or a lot of very basic environmental writing and things. So, just you end up very confused because they're not they're not it doesn't seem as if you're always getting very informed views about things like global warming and um, the I mean science writers science writing the news, daily newspaper seems to be all over the place and it kind of flits around from uh, and it, it does it doesn't seem anything like as competent as the science I was praising that you see on television that's interesting. Well, maybe, maybe there'll be questions later on to ask you more about that. Do well, you, uh, just to give you an example, yeah. I mean, there was a famous example a, a year or so ago, which um, the, the Telegraph um, suggested that there was something like one cod left in the North Sea. Uh, you know, that there was yeah. that the, the number of cod. <laughs> and they got, completely got the facts wrong. Um, that the, the cod were essentially extinct in the North Sea, and that's n not true at all. I mean, cod are endangered, but, there's, but there are still millions of fish out there. And um, but somebody who, you know, somebody who really should have been mm. a trained scientist mm. in handling that story was obviously was dealing with something mm. that was uh, you know, way out of their depth. You seem to fit in very well with, with scientists because you, you are naturally curious. I don't know how long you've had your passion for science, but for many people, you know, the things that you're curious about only they only realize how fascinating they are once you've raised the question. I read somewhere, you'd like to know how many pigeons there are in Britain. 
And you think, yeah, that's a, what an interesting question. I wonder who can work that out. I mean, are these questions that are constantly well, running yeah, around your head? I mean, I, I don't think there's anything unnatural about the, my level of curiosity, but I just think curiosity is a really good thing. And I think it's something that, that we tend to neglect as we get older. I mean, you know, I hardly need to point out to you that all children are intensely curious about everything, and they drive us crazy with, you know, Daddy, why is the sky blue, and all, all those questions like that. Um, but just constantly asking us, and, and as we get older, we stop asking those questions. Um, and, there's, and I think that's unfortunate, because, you know, very often they're really interesting questions. And, and so all, all that I've ever done in my career professionally is just, you know, when I get a question like that, or, or when I do a book on a, a subject, and it throws up a series of questions like that, then I try and answer those questions. It's just an, it's, it's an interesting opportunity to do so, but it's also, I think, sheds light on things in a way that you know, brings a certain measure of novelty to the exercise. Your most recent book, and I think this will be the last question before I open it up to the, to the audience, um, and you've since gone on to write other popular science books uh, after you wrote Short History of Nearly Everything, um, but your latest book was out last year, uh, one summer, and it's about this particular summer in America, in 1927, that seems to have been this remarkable year where so, so much happens. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the summer of 1927 was ex an extraordinary, I mean, it's really quite a magical summer, a period of five months from, I took the book as May the 1st until September the 30th, so a kind of long summer, but, but really, you know, not, not stretching things too much at all. And, and what it was, was I'd always been fascinated by the fact that these two very iconic events in America happened simultaneously that summer. One of them was that Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. And that was huge in a way that we've forgotten now. That was a, the Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic. I'd always mm. just assumed that he, you know, he just took it into his head to fly the Atlantic and he did it and that's why he became famous. But actually there was a huge race going on at the time and there were lots and lots of other teams of, of pilots um, all better funded and in, in much more magnificent planes than his, who were all set to go. And then from out of nowhere, this, this kid from Minnesota, a 25-year-old kid, flies in from the West. And because he's got a, actually got a much simpler plane, he manages to get airborne first. But he's flying with a plane as, as, as a single engine, which everyone would thought was insane. It doesn't have a radio. He doesn't have a co-pilot. So everybody thought he was, it was just suicidal, and yet the world became transfixed with, is this kid going to make it? Um, and when he did, the whole world erupted in, in a, probably the single most joyous outpouring of human emotion ever, because you know, the only thing you could, you could rank alongside it would be when wars end. But of course, when a war ends, there's you know, half the people are losers, so they're not quite as, as joyous as all that. And, and, and in any case, it's always tempered by the fact that you know, everybody's lost loved ones, yeah, yeah. and it's... Um, this was just pure joy. There was nothing, you know, there were no negatives to it at all. So the whole world just went crazy. Um, and I was, I've always been fascinated by that, because also because then Lindbergh didn't handle that fame very well at all, and his whole trajectory was, was downhill after his, this glorious summer. But at the same time, the, thing, the other thing that happened was that Babe Ruth, my great baseball hero, hit 60 home runs that summer, which was just you know, an incredible achievement. And, 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 in, and in, again, in quite a magical way, because he was, he was well into his 30s by this point. He was, he was deemed to be over the hill. Nobody expected him to do anything great again. Um, you know, he was, he was finished. He was fat and wheezy and, and overweight and, and was just thought, everybody thought he was finished. And then from out of nowhere, he performed this feat, which was just incomparable. Nobody's ever done anything like it. I, 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 I have no idea what the equivalent in a British sporting context would be, but it was just, it was, it was like Don Bradman, you know, having a triple century or something. Um, but it was, he just, it was just incredible. So it was, um, it, was an, it was an amazing feat. But then what I discovered, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but what, then what I discovered was that they were, Lindbergh and Babe Ruth were only a small part of this much more eventful, magical summer, um, because all these other things happened at the same time, and nobody had ever quite noticed that they were all happening simultaneously. I mean, it was the summer in which they filmed The Jazz Singer, the first real talking picture, which completely transformed popular entertainment and, um, and brought American voices to the world in a way that they hadn't ever been before. It was the summer of the Great Mississippi Flood, which is still the biggest natural disaster in, in American history. It was the summer they started um, carving Mount Rushmore, which was, again, it's just a wonderful story. I mean, Mount Rushmore was, 
just a cra crazy scheme to carve a mountain. <laughs> I mean, who would ever think to do that? And, and Mount Rushmore itself was in the middle of nowhere. It was, it was 150 miles from the nearest paved highway. Nobody, you know, if, even if this, this guy who carved it could get it off the ground, nobody was ever going to be able to go and see it. So it was just a completely crazy, harebrained scheme, and yet, you know, it was one of the great success stories in American history. And so just, it was just one thing like that after another. It was the summer of Al Capone's downfall. It was um, the summer in which Sacco and Vanzetti, these notorious anarchists were executed in America, and the whole world erupted in rioting um, in anti-American sentiment. Almost, almost on the heels of, of the joy that followed Charles Lindbergh, then, you know, one, one minute everybody's embracing you as an American in the streets of Paris or Rio or wherever because of Charles Lindbergh, the next minute they're throwing bricks at you or punching you in the face because of Sacco and Vanzetti. <laughs> so it was just this kind of extraordinary summer, and that's, the whole book became much less about Babe Ruth, you'll probably be pleased to hear, and, and <laughs> Charles Lindbergh, than about all these other things. But that it started in the same off time. as you, you were going to write sort of uh, the book changed of, of directions Lindbergh altogether, and, and, and it became the story of the summer, of the summer. Um, and how all of these events influenced each other in ways that I, d I don't think anybody had ever really particularly noticed before, and. And I just, I mean, I just thought it was, in itself, it was just fascinating that all of these things were happening simultaneously. It, you know, it sometimes happens that, that a nation or a society will be suddenly very productive in some area all, all, all at once. Just, it's just random occurrences. You know, I mean, why was Britain so productive with pop music in the 1960s, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And it's just because it, it just was. I mean, it just happened then, and you had suddenly had all of these people spouting up. Well, in America, it was almost entirely to the popular culture, and it was all focused on this one summer. It was just you know, a kind of extraordinary coming together of lots and lots of disparate things that were mostly, for the most part, totally you know, unconnected. Babe Ruth didn't hit 60 home runs because Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. Right, right. <laughs> Mississippi didn't flood because of Charles Lindbergh, you know, anything like that. These things were just happening randomly, but it was just in, intensely eventful. I think you'll have a few more book sales after that wonderful, <laughs> colourful description. Uh, listen, Bill, I, I've got more questions, but I do want to, because um, time's getting on, so I want to open this up to the audience. Um, so we, we have uh, roving mics. There's, there's, I guess they're somewhere. Where's the roving mics? There's one, one there and one there. So if people have a question for Bill, please raise your hand. And uh, OK, so um, Frank, first one there. So the th Third row in the aisle, uh, and then yes, and then gentleman there. That's it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I view you as a travel writer, and I loved your short history. I saw it as your journey to enlightenment. But if I mix the metaphors, if I compare you writing a book to a journey, do you know the destination before you start? And if not, how do you know when you've arrived? Oh well, mm. it, it depends very much on on the book and where it takes you. Um, and it, and it does vary from book to book, and there's a lot. I mean, a lot of it is to do with the with the book. I mean, if it's a travel book, it's, it's actually quite easy. You do undertake a, a journey, um, and you 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 know you you choose arbitrarily choose a starting point, and you know you're going to have a destination where you're going to where you're going to finish up at the end. Um, and that's really easy then for me as a writer. It's very easy to put the book together because it's all dictated. The structure of the book is dictated by the actual journey itself. Sometimes it's a little bit complicated how you, how you plot your route because, um, you know, some, like Britain is a really hard country to work your way around because it just, it's so, there's stuff everywhere and, and you know, you, you, there isn't a kind of coast to coast route or a sensible north to south route. Um, you, you have to wander all over the place. But, but allowing for that, the, the, the journey itself kind of dictates the shape of the book. Other books, I mean, I just mentioned with the 1927 book, changed completely because of what you're learning as you go. Um, the other book I had that, was, that ended up being quite different from the one I expected it to be was A, a Walk in the Woods, where I tried and spectacularly failed to hike the Appalachian Trail from end to end. Well, when I set off, I was, I was absolutely confident that I was going to walk the Appalachian Trail, every foot of it. And, um, and it was really hard for me to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't. And, and I thought, when, you know, when I realized quite early on in our, on our journey that I wasn't going to ever manage to walk all 2,200 miles, because it's just it's madness to try to do that. I mean, it is just, the people who do it, I'm full of admiration for them, but, but for most of us, the idea of actually successfully walking a, a trail that long is just, it's just insane. Um, you just can't do it. It's just, it's too taxing physically and mentally. 
So when I realized I wasn't going to do it, but I still had the commitment to get a book out of it, that became, then it became a completely different exercise altogether. So, yes, um, question over there. Yeah, thank you. I was interested in your contrast between how um, print journalists and uh, the television handle re reporting and covering science. Do you think that print journalists are still afraid that people don't want to read about science, that, that they can't write too much because people will lo lose the plot and, and, and drift away? Um, the, the Metro seem to do a little double page spread now occasionally on a science topic. It's not my favorite paper, but it, it, at least it tra seems to go a little bit more in depth. And I wondered whether you thought they were afraid. Yeah, well, it's... It, I, I mean, I don't know about if afraid is the right word, but, but certainly with, with print journalism now, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And, I mean, this not just in Britain, but everywhere in, in the world because the circulations are falling so, you know, in such a worrying way. And often they're just plunging, you know. And, and newspapers not quite sure how to reverse that or how to arrest that. And, um, and, and, but the one thing they, they absolutely don't want to do is, is be boring or, or, you know, to be very risk-taking in a way that I think television can get away with. Television can be a little bolder because you know you have a more or less captive audience to a much larger extent than with people who are actually um, you know, actually paying for each edition as a, as a separate purchase, as they do with the newspaper. People can walk away from a newspaper much easier than they can walk away from television as a form of entertainment. And um, so I think that's a factor. I mean, I, I, I know somebody who um, works in a national newspaper and they told me that I, I won't say which national newspaper it was, but it's quite shameful that it exists at all. But they they had an int introduced a policy that there would be no health stories unless there was a celebrity angle to it, um, and it's just that's the kind of world we're operating in. And I mean, I know that there's still quite a lot of good science writing goes on in the newspapers, but I think that it. It doesn't fit in with the general trend of what's happening with newspapers now, and, and I think also that a lot of newspapers are cutting corners and cutting budgets so much that they're ending up with people who probably don't qualify to be writing you know, uh, about the environment or about certain areas of science and aren't given the time to, to investigate these things carefully enough. Or perhaps there just isn't you know, the priority there that, that anybody cares that they should investigate it carefully enough. And I think, I think that's reflected quite often in the quality of stories that you see about science in the papers. Mm. Andrew, yeah, so it's a front row there, and then gentleman ha halfway along here. Was, and there's someone at the back, then someone at the back next for you. Yeah. Yeah. You contrasted uh, very briefly public understanding in the United States, specifically about uh, evolution, for example, and, and, and in Britain. Is that a general difference in, in levels of public understanding and acceptance of science? And if it is, what are the factors that account for it? Well, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the issue of evolution in America has become you know, much more politicized than it has elsewhere. And I, I think uh, evolution is, is less to do with, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's less to do with belief in, in the sense of knowledge belief and more to do with faith. And, um, and a lot of people in America see evolution as a real challenge to their faith. And, and um, they see it as a kind of an affront. And, and that, that perception has, has just not happened elsewhere, and certainly not to the same degree. I know that there are people in Britain who have very conservative religious views that are, are not very um, sympathetic to evolution as a science. But, but I think, on the whole, it's it's kept you know, below the radar, it's not, it's not a major issue. Whereas in America, almost everywhere, it's, there's a real struggle to keep, um, you know, to, to allow evolution to be taught as some um, conventional science in schools. It's constantly being challenged. Yeah. Well, hello, Bill, and hello again, Jim. I was at a lecture by Jim only yesterday. So you were, God. Just another is it, is meeting by all it was uh, meeting yesterday? at the House of Parliament only last week. I seem to be becoming an Al Khalili groupie. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my, 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 my question is, uh, Bill, you, you are, we have heard that you are, a, I've read all your books, and uh, we've heard that you are a very versatile writer. You've written on science, you've written on language, Mother Tongue, the best book ever written on the English language. Well, thank you. Uh, made in America, which is supposed to be about the American English, but, uh, but, uh, Contains a very great deal of of of, of, uh, of uh, social social history. 
question? Uh, your versatility was, was shown when, uh, about the same time, out came uh, The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, a memoir of life in Iowa. I've done the interview, and, it, so maybe you could uh, just uh, ask Bill the question. And a biography of Shakespeare. So my question is, do you ever resent being typecast, A, as a travel writer, and B, as a humorous writer, when a, you have written about much more than travel, and B, a great deal of your writing is very serious. I've seen your non-travel books under travel in, in bookshops. And, uh, oh, yeah, no, that's, it, it, it's, you do get categorized, and, and I, do, I mean, I don't resent it at all. You have to be, you know, they have to put your books somewhere, and um, <laughs> it's, I, I, if, if they're all in, you know, the travel section, that doesn't, that doesn't actually bother me at all. I, um, but it is strange because, you know, I, I do like to do different kinds of writing. And um, for a long time, almost everything I wrote was, was intended to be comical because, I mean, that was just expected of me. And, I, and, and so that was the main driving force of everything I wrote. But at the same time, I was doing, in those days, I was doing a lot of articles for quite serious publications. I did a lot for the New York Times magazine and I did a lot for National Geographic in, in those days. And I had a couple of occasions people would come to me and, and say, oh, I saw your article in National Geographic last month. I, I assume they, um, the editors cut all your jokes out. <laughs> as, if, as if I had a kind of Tourette syndrome of jokes. <laughs> you know, that I have to make these jokes all the time. Actually, it was a relief not to have to make jokes sometimes. I mean, I do really like writing more seriously. But in terms of how you're categorized, it's, you know, if people pay attention to you at all, that's a, that's a victory. <laughs> so um, I, I don't... You know, I don't resent. I mean, I wouldn't know. There isn't a particular place in the bookshop I, I ought to go. So wherever they put me, I'm grateful. <laughs> Let's have two final questions from the back then. So one there, and then one from this side. Yes, a, a w waving. So right down at the back. Um, OK. Hi, I am a middle school science teacher. And if you can tell by my accent, I'm from America. So hello. <laughs> The reason why, I w well, what I want to ask you was this. I love science, and I infect it in the classroom. I love having my students smile, and they enjoy science with me. So when you tell me that you are uninterested because of your teachers, it kind of hit home. My issue that I see with my students is even though they love science and they get super excited, it seems like their confidence hasn't caught up with their excitement. How can we, not only me as a teacher, but us as society, increase their confidence level so they realize they are scientists regardless of what they want to do in life and also increase that curiosity? Well, it's a really good question. Where are you from, by the way? Um, well, I'm originally from New York, but I'm teaching in North Carolina and Charlotte. OK. And how did you happen to be here tonight? Uh, <laughs> vacationing. Oh, wow. <laughs> Spring break. Really? Yep. Well, I'm so honored that you're here. There's a lot of other things you could be doing in London. I, <laughs> <laughs> is, I hope you have a great time here. I, in terms of teaching and, and how you engage and excite children, I don't know. I get asked this question from time to time, and, and I've, I've never really come up with a satisfactory answer. Because on the one hand, you know, science teaching has a duty to produce new generations of chemists and physicists and biologists and so on. So you have to teach it at a fairly serious level. I mean, you can't be too flippant about it. And, and I think, you know, and there are lots of people. I mean, there's a proportion of people in any classroom who are, have a natural aptitude for that and will respond to serious teaching of, I mean, obviously, you, you know, there's some time in your career, somebody taught you physics in a way that made you think, this is yeah. what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. Absolutely. Well, I can honestly tell you that that would never have happened to me. And, yeah. um, and it would never happen to a lot of people. But so what do you do about those people that it's never going to happen to? I, mean, I think the one thing that's, that schools do quite well is, is teach, is capture the, the Jim Al-Khalilis of the world and, you know, can get them. I think Britain does that particularly well. Of, turning out new, new generations of, of really good physicists and chemists and so on. But there is this other large group of people, like me, who are never going never to become scientists, but at the same time ought not to go through life blind to what science does for us and how it does things for us. So somehow there's got to be space made in the curriculum to, to capture these people. <coughs> and you touched on something interesting earlier, Jim, one of the, one of the things you, you mentioned, which was that 
you know, when you read my book, you knew all about the physics and everything, but you didn't know very much about the geology mm -hmm. and some of the other things. So somehow, perhaps, you know, more general science teaching, uh, that there, I don't think there's any harm in telling, conveying to people quite often that science is amazing, it's wonderful. It, in, and not only is it, you know, absolutely in, innately fascinating, but it also answers questions and solves problems. And, you know, if, the, if we're going to live in a world a hundred years from now that's worth living in, it'll be science that gets us there. And I think that's something that, that schools are not very good at, both in America and in Britain and probably everywhere else, not very good at, at doing. Um, they get so focused on just kind of creating new generations of scientists that they forget that there's also a, a sort of public relations exercise they ought to be engaged in as well. So how you do that, I don't know, but I'm not a teacher. I just know that it needs to be done. Well, we are running out of time, so I'm afraid there was a hand waving wildly at the back, and I'm afraid we're going to have to make that the last one. I just wanted to say that I recently read your book, The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, and I just want to ask, you were saying in, in that book about how amazing the 1950s were, and I just want to ask, are you happy in how the world has changed? changed over time, how it is nowadays in science and in other subjects and aspects of the world? Yeah, that's a really good question and a really quite complicated question as you can, as you can imagine. And one of the things I talked about uh, in my conclusion to Short History Nearly Everything was that we, you know, that we are, as human beings, we are in this completely insane position that we are, at the same time, we are the, the best hope for life on this planet and its worst nightmare. And that just seems to me crazy. Um, an example I gave in the, in the book was that um, at, the very, at the very moment that, that um, Newton was propounding the laws of gravitation and coming, you know, arriving at these incredibly insightful conclusions about the universe and how it's put together, you know, in a, in a way that, no, you know, it was just head and shoulders above anything that had preceded him. At the very same moment, you know, somewhere in Mauritius, somebody was beating to death the last dodo on Earth. And it just seems like crazy that, that, that you know, human beings can be, at this, on the one hand, so in, in creative and imaginative and productive and do all of these wonderful things, and at the same time do all of these really felonious, terrible, nightmarish things. Um, you know, the one species can be you know, constantly doing these two things. So when you ask me, do, am I happy with the way that things have turned out, the answer is, you know, absolutely and not at all. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and I think that's the, always going to be the story with humanity. And I just hope that the parts, the, the positive parts, ultimately somehow outweigh the, the negative ones, because we are incredibly capable of doing the most wonderful things. I mean, humans is a, as an entity, do the most fabulous things. I mean, just look around London at some of the buildings you see, or listen to music, or all, all kinds of things like that. But at the same time, I mean, we're just so foolish, and I, um, I just can't believe that we're still making some of the mistakes we're making, but we have to hope that we persuade others to stop making those mistakes. Thank you, Bill. Well, that's been insightful, um, charming, entertaining. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've had a lovely Hour. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Bill Galletly for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.